Our next session here, we're going to be hearing directly from a few SFU instructors and students who have worked on uh, open projects and are leading open uh, education initiatives here at SFU to hear a little bit about some of the, uh, the hows, the whys, the whats of uh, OER in action um, here at SFU. Great. So, uh, hi everyone. So, I'm Deanna Bedoya and I teach in biomedical physiology and kinesiology. And I really started using uh, one open textbook in one of my courses because it just made the most sense at the time. I didn't plan on being an advocate for it, but uh, I'm really happy with how it went. And it really started with uh, just remembering how broke I was as a student myself <laughs> and uh, all the extra costs that come along with being a student. And I also remember spending a lot of money on textbooks that I never really used. And I was getting that in my evaluation sometimes as well from students. They were saying that the textbook was X amount of dollars, usually about $150, and they ended up studying from my course notes more than anywhere, any, more, more anyways. So, um, so that's kind of how it began. It's really around uh, cost saving. That was my number one priority. And just more, I'm a big advocate for student well-being as well, and I think that's financial constraints are a big, a big issue this, these days as well. So. Um, as I was just saying to my colleague, it's funny that whenever I seem to give a talk, there seems to be something relevant that pops up in the news or on some of my social media feed. And if you'll advance the slide. Uh, so this came up, on, if you're familiar with Reddit, this came up this week. Uh, this is what a 239 textbook looks like, never open, returned in plastic from the same place I bought it. Uh, and he got $7 back mm. from it. Right, and this isn't the first time I've seen things like this pop up on different types of, of media, and if you'll advance it. I've always found it really interesting to li read the comments that are under these posts as well, and s it speaks to a lot of what Lucas was talking about with the different memes that he showed that, you know, instructors will change one chapter or move the the notes around and whatever, now you have to buy a new edition because the old course readings don't apply. And the students notice this, they talk about it, and, and I remember being really frustrated with it myself when I was a student. So um, I've really tried in all of my classes in different ways to, to try my best to reduce costs. You make concessions, and that's something that I have realized, but at the end, you know, I want my students to have a good experience and leave with a better experience so they hopefully think back fondly and remember the information uh, better as well. So that's where this started from. Oh yeah, this is another one, so I liked. Remember this when the Alumni Association comes begging for money, right? Send them $7, but tell them it's $239, right? <laughs> so we want them to leave with a good opinion and, uh, you know, adding extra and extra costs, it just, you know, it just it affects their experience. Some more than others, some come with a lot of money, but you know, I was super broke. I lived on ramen for, you know, <laughs> or bowl noodles for the end of my first year and I, that wasn't fun, so I don't feel good. So, um, I just made a chart of what I've done in my different classes. I really only have one class where I've started using open education resources as far as the definition that Lucas used, something that is open and adaptable. Um, but in all my courses, I've really tried to, I looked at these costs and they're just insane and times that by four per, per, per semester for as many courses as a student takes and it really does add up quite quickly. So um, when I was developing the, um, the basic anatomy course, which is an online course, these students aren't going to med school. They're taking this course usually as a prerequisite to get into other health professionals, pr professions where they're probably gonna have to buy other anatomy textbooks anyway. So I was like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna make them buy another textbook and an atlas, because in anatomy you need, atlas is the one with all the pictures in it. You kind of need both of those. So that's where I started kind of looking for an, op an open education resources. I think I'd gotten an email about it. I had never heard of it before. So I started to explore the options and I found a textbook that wasn't perfect. Um, it was anatomy and physiology, which obviously go, and s go hand in hand quite well, but um, I kind of made the decision that it was the best for them in their situation. What I did with the material is I uh, took the textbook I used the images from the textbook and I made course notes from that using the textbook to follow along. I didn't know at the time, this is a few years ago, how to directly adapt it 
and I wish I had, and I wish I had applied for one of the grants so I could have kind of spent more time on that. But I made my own course notes based on the textbook and I used their images and their tables and all that stuff because I didn't know how to find, you know, uh, those pictures and, and, and the sort online that would be, you know, available and not copyrighted. So that's why I did that and I told them, buy an atlas if you want to, one that works for you, or just use Google Images, you know, because you can find a lot of pictures online with that as well. So if you'll advance. So this is, I use the um, uh, OpenStax, which is one of the resources Lucas mentions as well. And yes, it is, I find really great for uh, science. Not for me so much, because I teach nutrition and I teach health, uh, and I couldn't find anything, and maybe I just didn't know what else is out there. Um, I, it's hard with nutrition because our understanding of it is changing all the time, so it's hard to find something that's kind of up to date. But the only one kind of in the list of textbooks that they had that worked for me was the anatomy and physiology one. So uh, that's what I built my course from, and if you'll advance. And I didn't do this work. The pe lovely people at uh, Distance Education uh, built this into the, um, the course page, the intro page, where it talks about the textbook, and uh, talks about the licensing and the authorship, and I'm sure they did that based on the actual uh, parameters that the authors had had. So they built that in there for me, but um, I'm sure that if you do use this in your course, you have to use the, the appropriate language as well. Um, but I wanna, could you actually just go back to the table? So you'll notice that that's what I did for the one class. With my other classes, I'm really trying to minimize expensive textbooks. There's only really one textbook that is kind of on the higher end of things that I use, which is the, the um, the custom courseware for my health class. It's $75. That's kind of where I like to max out myself. Um, and there's used copies available it as well. But for my nutrition class, what I've done is I've created my PowerPoint slides with that are very detailed and I have notes underneath. Now, the concession I made is that it's work. But this is coming from feedback from my students saying, I just study from her notes anyway. I just study from her slides anyway. The textbook was just like extra, but I just like, you'll get an, uh, an a, a B plus, you know, mm -hmm. if you just study from her slides. So why not, if they're studying from that anyway, why not make the slides more detailed, right? And that's what I'm using. And something else I've used in the nutrition class is I used, we use a diet, we do a diet analysis project and I, they used to buy $30 diet analysis software, but there's an online app that's not perfect, but a lot of people use anyway, and they're probably, people often use it after the class as well, which is called my fitness pal. It's not perfect, it doesn't have all the nutrients I want, but again, it's concessions, right? And they're ultimately really happy when they come the first day and I'm like, all you really have to buy is an eye clicker, which you can use for your other classes anyway, right? So if you'll go to the last slide now. So this is kind of just how, just to show you how I've built my, my lecture slides. Um, and I'm actually okay putting these out there too. I don't know how to do that to make those open, but I, I don't actually care. Like, people want to share it. Um, but I have kind of the basic notes. And this semester, it's taken great pains, but I've added in some, some more material in the notes section to make sense of what's above. So the other concession I've taken is that I am not following the laws of good PowerPoint slides as far as having less <laughs> points on the slides and more impactful pictures because now my slides are notes, right? That's how I've built them. So again, and I tell them that, I'm like, well, you know, but they're happy about it. You know, they're saving $150. They're pretty happy the first day, sets a good tone from the first day I find. And um, I'll see what happens at the end of the semester if they, they appreciate that. But with the, the anatomy course, no complaints about the open textbook. They're pretty happy about in the, 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 my evaluations, they say I'm happy that there is an open textbook. Yeah, so that's what I have to say. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience and uh, um, trying to find creative strategies for saving students money on course materials and uh, experience with adopting an open textbook. Um, what we're going to do after each talk is just pause and see if there are any questions um, uh, for each of our presenters. Uh, does anyone have any questions for uh, Diana? Mr. Comment, actually, I do the same thing, mm -hmm. and I hear from the students, they say her PowerPoints are not like people, like one or two of you, you know, 
words, but I have like just like yours. Mm -hmm. And I have pictures when I'm doing the lectures, so mm -hmm. like, and I remove because I can't like you know now I I, I don't ask them to buy the textbook. I say go to the first edition, you know, I don't care mm -hmm. as long as you know because I know these prices are so high. So um, I do almost everything on the mm -hmm. slides, <laughs> and they love they love them as well. Right? So that is how I make them happy. And, uh, but they see the pictures in the while they are, you know, and I tell them. When you look like once in a while in between, you have the pictures and then referring to that. I still have the textbook that I base this on, like uh, recommend it if they want to, and I tell them that there's like cheaper online versions. But I I wrote I co-authored that textbook, and it part of me but pisses me off that I get this much money <laughs> when the textbook company is making this much money, and the students think we're like profiting, you know, so much from this, and it really is. There's there's if you've ever author co-authored a textbook there's so many people along that chain that need to get paid right so you're pumping their pockets instead of like the one that does all the work and that I don't like that <laughs> how can you follow their textbook outline and use their picture and graph mm -hmm. if you are not a co-author of that book and how can you deal with the copyrights mm -hmm. that's a good question <laughs> Um, I, I struggle with that myself, so I try to make my own charts and I draw my own pictures in my class as well, or I try to use pictures that are uh, available uh, open as well on, online. Um, but again, you make some concessions there. I draw my own pictures too, sometimes as well. I tell them I'm not an artist, but um, there are some that are, that are more open and available. But yeah, it makes, it makes it more difficult. And that's why it's great having, and that's basically why I use the open textbook for the anatomy class, because I was like, I can't draw, like, the, 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 yeah, I can't draw anything <laughs> to do with the human body, so it, it does make it difficult, yeah. But if you're developing things with uh, the Center for, Online, uh, Center for Online and Distance Education, they are great for helping to build resources and pictures and animations even that you can build into your course. Um, I think next we're going to hear from, uh, from Aaron Hogg from Archaeology. Um, hi everyone. So I'm um, a PhD candidate in the Department of Archaeology. And so I'm going to give you, it's a little bit open access, a little bit OER, but a grad student's perspective, hopefully, about how OER is effective, but also can kind of boost uh, your graduate training. Um, so. I study law and policy issues related to archaeology, um, so I'm not an archaeologist, archaeologist. I'm not a traditional archaeologist, is what you would say, so we can advance. Um, and I first became involved in open access more generally, in OER specifically, um, with my work with the uh, Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage, or IPINT project, which was um, a seven-year SHRC-funded project based out of SFU, um, which included community-based uh, cultural heritage issue projects around the world um, run by academic partners and indigenous communities uh, around the world and it ran from 2008 to 2016 and I was an associate and a research assistant for the project and so one of the things that the project did is they created this like set throughout the seven years of the project they created this massive database of all resources related to the project um, but when it ended they needed to find a way to archive it on the internet uh, while still being cognizant of any copyright issues. So they hired me as a research assistant to go th help them go through it and determine what was actually open access and could be available on the web, um, which was sadly about 1% of the entire database when it came down to it. And we contacted people and asked, you know, can we, can we put this up? Are you okay? Can we get the copyright? But, you know, the vast majority of these things just weren't open access. They couldn't be up there. Um, and then I'm also a research associate. Oh, we can go back to that one. Sorry, Hope. Um, for my department, we started a new professional online master's program for practicing um, heritage professionals uh, 
normally in North America, but we're hoping to get more international mm -hmm. students. And so we've now had two cohorts of this program. Um, but back in 2015, I was helping my supervisor and others build the curriculum for the courses. And so one of the things we did was trying to find, um, I built bibliographies of appropriate course material and tried to come up with appropriate course assignments that would provide as much OER as possible, especially because it's an online um, distance-based program. We don't expect that the students are only required to come to campus for an um, orient in-person orientation and when they defend their thesis. So not only do they have to, like if they have to buy textbooks, they, they can't even come to the SFU library bookstore to get them. They'd have to order them to their house, which uh, the, the profs didn't like, and they didn't really want the students to spend any money because they're working professionals, and unfortunately, they already have to spend the uh, professional tuition amount, so the, the program is already quite expensive. Um, and actually, we one of the things we did is one of their assignments is they have to create uh, Wikipedia pages, um, and they have to go on and determine its um, international her cultural heritage policies. And so we went through and determined all of these policies that don't actually have Wikipedia pages. And so they have to create just one um, that they don't publish for a course assignment. And then we've suggested to several students, you know, this is great, you should publish it. And so we've had several students create their own Wikipedia pages, uh, which is a really nice assignment for graduate students, and it gives them something tangible that they actually do. And so I used some of these experiences to apply for um, OpenCon, which is an international conference on open access and OER and open data. And I attended. Uh, in DC in 2016, and if anyone is interested in these uh, and have some ex little bit of experience with open access, OpenCon is a great experience, um, and they provide funding for. I was, I was able to go fully funded for junior scholars and uh, really, if you have a need, um, and it's a it's a phenomenal experience, and I learned a lot. Uh, so my experiences and my supervisor's experiences, we can. Thank you. Um, led us to apply for the first round of OER grants um, back in February of 2016. And we did this because he was, my supervisor, John Welch, was scheduled to teach a new course for the, our department um, in, what did we call it? Cultural Heritage Scholarship in Global Context. And so it's an introduction to cultural heritage for a 200 level. Um, and it was the department's first breadth humanities course. and. Um, we actually wrote the OER grant together, and I'm listed um, as an OER grant recipient, which I'll, I'll speak to about, too, is it's a great experience for graduate students to have an opportunity to, one, write a grant, and two, be listed as a grant recipient. And it was a really big boost to my CV, and also gave me some experiences that I don't get. And it's different than writing a scholarship application, right? Um, these were these are great experiences that I've had throughout my graduate education here. Um, and we felt that this course worked really well for an OER grant because cultural heritage is, uh, it, it's this quickly changing field. And so not only are there not a ton of resources out there for it, but they're very quickly in adapting. So if we ask the students to buy a textbook, it wouldn't be relevant in a few years' time. Um, and so we felt that because of that, it was a great fit for OER. Um, so we used the OER grant uh, with me acting as an RA for the project, which was also a great line of funding. Thanks, Hope. <laughs> uh, and we consulted with the library and TLC staff on curriculum and delivery plans, uh, which got my supervisor really thinking about how to uh, craft good learning outcomes. Um, and so we tried to customize OER, uh, not just for the course readings, but also build them into the course assignments. Um, and our main struggle with it is that we struggled, as I think people have been saying, there's a lot of OER and a lot of open textbooks available for the harder sciences, but as you delve into the social sciences, there are fewer resources available. And so we struggled to find resources that were available for um, in the field, but also for junior level scholars. If this was a 400 level course, there's a lot of great, really in-depth articles out there that we could have adapted, but because it's a junior level course, it just wasn't at their level. They, it was not things that would have been appropriate for the course. Um, 
So the OER that we did use was mainly blogs and web pages and videos, but it was very well received by the students. Anything we put in, they loved, um, and they pr appreciated the variation in instructional material. Um, and an outcome of this is that we were able to create this indexed and annotated list of OER for the course, um, organized by the course learning outcomes, which is available on Summit. And so we've now used this list in, um, in other courses, uh, particularly my supervisor's course in our master's program. Um, so it's a nice resource that's up there that's available for uh, other appropriate courses. Um, so I, I guess, again, I want to emphasize that the benefit of this grant, it, the benefits that these grants have for graduate students. So it's an opportunity to hire graduate students to be RAs for the, pro, for the grant and to help you find resources or to build a textbook, which are experiences that graduate students don't often get, especially in my department. It's really hard to find teaching experiences. We have very few tutorials. That's a whole other can of worms. But, um, provided me with cash, which is useful, but it also increased my knowledge of OER and allowed me to participate in a panel like this, um, which is, again, it's just a, it's a great CV boost, and it's also great for the next generation of scholars who might be teaching these courses in the years to come to get them to recognize the benefit of OER and how they can adapt it into their future practices. Um, so we can go to the final slide. Uh, so finally, my foray into OER doesn't end with that grant. Um, I'm currently involved with two open access projects, both with OER components. So my department is home to a 45-year-old press, archaeology press, and uh, it's published 21 monographs and 15 edi edited volumes, and it's a pretty indispensable part, actually, of Northwest Coast archaeology. Um, but Two years ago, our editor of the press, uh, who's a professor emeritus, Roy Carlson, uh, wanted to retire from running the press. He's in his mid-80s. It was, it was time. Uh, he's, a, he's absolutely incredible. So we applied for an SFU library digitization grant um, to completely digitize the press and make them available online open access. Um, and so today, you can access the entire press and download the entirety of all of the books. Um, and some of these books are still being used in classrooms uh, or in tutorials. And I've had several TAs actually tell their students to, you know, that they can access these books online and download them, uh, which was which is pretty cool. And Ali, are the books searchable through libraries? Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. I thought so. Okay. And. Um, Finally, to ensure that the press didn't end with the digitization project, we've, um, we've used it to support our new um, open access digital peer reviewed journal called Inlet Contributions to Archaeology, which is um, supported by our faculty, but student led myself and Travis Freeland, another graduate student in my department, are serving as co-editors with a team of six uh, students um, sitting on the editorial board and we're accepting short articles that communicate findings, reflect new directions, and disseminate information that may not fit under a traditional publication, um, but the articles are peer-reviewed and available online. And so again, it's, this is just another venue that my department and that we're interested in, um, in putting more information available openly online that could be adapted to be used in a classroom. Um, and so just in conclusion, and apologize, I talk really fast. Uh, OER and open access has really shaped my graduate education. Um, I've been part of projects since the beginning of my master's to now almost the end of my PhD. And it's allowed me to make connections, not just throughout my discipline, but also throughout the university. I have connections with staff at the TLC and at the library, um, and it's helped me really build my CV in ways that I wouldn't have thought possible at the beginning of my graduate education. And I strongly encourage other students to try to get involved and faculty to try to find ways to involve their students in these projects. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for uh, kind of sharing those experiences and um, sort of some of the benefits of working on open projects for graduate students. I think we do have time for a couple questions if there are questions for Erin. questions is good too. <laughs> <laughs> there will also be time at the end for kind of general questions for the panel as well. Um, going once, going twice. <laughs> I'd love 
digitization. I'm thinking of some I have this this little slide which one of the professor and writer said is this is now, but they're very valuable slides. And slides means the, you know the Yeah, words. yeah. <laughs> and I started digitizing some of those, it takes a lot of my time. So how how to get the digitization? Do they help you or just a grant and get a student to work on? Yeah, I think there's people in this audience that can speak to this. <laughs> so SMU Library runs a digitization grant program. I'm not sure what our next uh, intake is, but that, like the items you're talking about are excellent candidates um, for digitization. So you can apply, talk about uh, what the material that you have is, kind of what your intended outcome is, and then you can work with the library. We work on kind of the digitization aspects, and then we ask that you provide a support in kind, either a grad student or yourself, to sort of provide metadata about the items to describe them so that they can then be, be used and be made openly available. So absolutely happy to talk about it uh, further. Great, thanks and thanks Ellie for jumping in there. <laughs> uh, all right, I think we will move on then to uh, our next speaker who is uh, Lee Davis from the Department of English. Great. Do you mind if I use the remote so I'm yeah, not like doing this mm -hmm. with my neck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. It's fabulous. Thank Let's you. See if this works. Yeah. Okay. Let me just test this out. <coughs> Amazing. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Leith Davis. I'm in the English department. Um, and I, I'd like to tell you about an OE pro OER project that I was uh, involved in creating and implementing using with one of my classes. Um, and I'll be giving you the instructor's perspective on it. I was able to hire um, an honor student of mine, um, Brian Shannon, who'll be giving you the student perspective mm -hmm. on the project. So from the instructor's point of view. Um, this is my field of specialization. I work in 18th century literature. Woohoo! And um, I'm specifically interested in, yes, I know there were 18th century enthusiasts out there. Um, and I'm specifically interested in media ecology. So I look at songs, ballads, um, manuscripts, and I look at what happens with the new media of the 18th century print and how that changes the media ecology. Um, there are lots of texts and also open educational resources on 18th century poetry, novels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's not a problem getting print resources. But my issue was how do I teach my students about the rest of the media ecology? So ballads and manuscripts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, letters, which are also really important in conveying um, the ideas from the 18th century. Um, and I'm also interested in giving my students an idea about the material processes. So how was paper made? How did that impact how people were able to or not able to um, present uh, print um, letters, et cetera, et cetera. So that was my kind of dilemma. And I spent a lot of time in my courses searching around, finding, looking for materials, putting them on my Canvas course shell. Um, and I wasn't particularly happy with the way that I was able to do that. Now, I'm a complete learner when it comes to open educational resources. Luckily, um, through you working with the OER people, HOPE, um, the library as well, the Digital, hum and digital Humanities um, um, Innovation Lab at the library, uh, and the TLC, we were able to see what's out there and to see what might be available for us to use, for me to use in this. Um, and we determined to use Omeka.net, which is a, um, a, a platform that allows you to present material, kind of curate it. Um, so upload materials and then bring them together in different groups for exhibits. Um, this was the beginning of what I thought when we started out would be the database of online resources of media in the long 18th century. Dormly. <laughs> Catchy, right? <laughs> no. Okay, how about this? It morphed into the database of 18th century media online. Demo. Bad idea. <laughs> Brian and I figured that wasn't going to fly. So. What it is now is eighteenth <laughs> century media online. Okay, short and simple. Emo. <laughs> um, and through the OER account, I was able to fund Brian to, uh, to work on this summer IRA position where he 
scouted out these resources, um, he uploaded them to the Omeka site, and he entered the metadata. He also created a bibliography of resources that I could use also on that. Um, and here it is, da 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 da, 18th century media online. Um, so with this beautiful project, then I was able to pilot it with my graduate course, English 832, which was media and cultural memory um, in our, our Britain, 1688 to 1745. Now, the students interfaced with this in two ways. Um, one, this became part of the required reading for them. The database hmm. itself was the course textbook, along with one novel and several um, PDFs of critical articles. Um, and they also had an assignment themselves, which made them co-creators in the site. So the assignment was to find two kinds of, of um, two texts, songs, ballads, manuscripts that were not on the database, to upload them and discuss them, analyze them, and curate an exhibit. And um, they were given a workshop in October, it was a fall class, um, Brian came to facilitate that workshop to help them with some of the bumps, which you can talk about yeah. in your presentation. Um, and then those exhibits are now part, permanent part of the site. So I had students who were looking, for example, at the Battle of the Boyne and using um, uh, paintings and analyzing those paintings. Um, we gave them the talk about copyright as well. Don't worry, they're not <laughs> pulling things from uh, all over places. Um, the Glorious Revolution and the propaganda for the Glorious Revolution. Um, you're with me, right, here with all these? <laughs> yes, good. Um, and the data, the Darien Venture by the Company of Scotland. So there's all these poems and songs that were written about that. So the students basically used the resource um, as their material, and they also co-created um, by using these exhibits. Um, now, future directions. I would like to expand this project to involve more um, of the faculty in my department, and um, I also wish to present this um, at the 18th century studies, in Canadian 18th century studies, to try and interest other people who are in my field in using the database too, perhaps in their course. Um, so just briefly then to conclude, there was our <coughs> project. My assessment of it, there were some really great things. It was great to have the students have free access to more materials. Very convenient for me. Here's the database, um, and I would provide it to them. Um, the students themselves got digital humanities experience, as did Brian, my RA, um, who got employment and also some valuable digital humanities skills. Um, challenges, it was really interesting having that brainstorm meeting. Um, what I'd originally wanted was different than what we came up with, and I was just reflecting on how much technology and kind of changes or shapes the vision of what you're able to do. So there were some things that I wanted to have, like annotations that didn't really work out, if you remember the back there, that early stage. Um, the time collecting the material, I think Lucas talked about time, right, the initial time. Um, a lot of time planning the whole thing. Hopefully that time will pay off in the long run, but um, at the time it was a lot of, of time and work. Um, and for students, using the site could actually be easier. So I think we're maybe at the beginning of the stage where these things will be more available, more easy. Um, so that's my perspective. Maybe I'll just um, hand over to Brian and then how about, can we keep the questions yeah, that, that till the good. end? And we'll take questions yeah. after that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I don't have any slides. Okay. I'm going okay. just yeah right. off paper, not we'll online. Give you a good visual in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I did my I finished my undergraduate degree at SFU, uh, an English degree last uh, spring, um, and then I, I did uh, my, my honors degree honors uh, project under Professor Davis, and then I was lucky enough to uh, be employed as an RA for this project. So I don't have a huge amount of, of teaching experience or, or digital humanities experience other than what I learned through this project. So I think I can maybe speak a little bit more about um, my sort of perspective as a student and how I could see how uh, this resource could be useful to students because I was just coming fresh out of being a student. So I was sort of trying to think about that as we were working on 
um, creating this site. Um, so during my degree, uh, I did some classes with Professor Davis where we were using Canvas a little bit, so sort of a, I almost saw it as a bit of a forerunner to what we were doing with this project, where there was materials posted online and some work being done online, but a little bit less organized into one uh, website. And so some of the benefits of that was, it's already been mentioned, but the big thing right off the bat was that it was free material. That was awesome. I mean, as an English student, I was buying tons and tons of textbooks for every class. So having a class where everything is online, there, done. Like the syllabus is laid out. I can see what the reading, it's just like super organized, super available and free. So that was like, that's a big thing that um, I think an online resource gives. Um, I think it also offered uh, access to some really unique um, items that I just wouldn't have had the chance to look at, especially in an undergrad degree if I was working solely off of printed works or sort of stuff that was more available um, through print. So I had the opportunity to look at stuff that isn't looked at as much and as an undergrad student that's super exciting to be able to look at things that maybe haven't had much uh, like scholarship done on them. So you just, it's more exciting. I mean, you get to look at, rather than looking at a Wordsworth poem that everyone's looked at a million times. You get to look at it, something that's just this letter you found online or mm. this manuscript you found that you don't know what you're looking at, so you get to kind of have that discovery. It's really exciting. Mm. Um, and it's also a huge help in peer learning. Um, when I was a student, we did some projects that were done on, on the website, and then this one as well, there's projects on the website, and that's a huge help just in facilitating um, being able to meet up together and do projects is not always feasible as an undergrad student with people's schedules and being available and getting things done. But it's almost like um, having a more organized Google Doc that everyone can work off of. And at the same time, the instructor can see the work that's being done and being contributed by which students. So you really have that, you, your work's being validated and you can work together and you can be really flexible on time and meeting and stuff like that. So as a peer um, uh, uh, resource, it's really valuable that way too. Um, So my job mostly uh, was finding um, objects and items to put onto the site. Um, uh, we were looking mostly, how it was sort of organized is by, uh, we were organized, it, that was kind of a big thing about the project was deciding how to organize it and that was really interesting to me as a student to sort of see how important that is in, the, in, in what people learn is how it's constructed and how it's organized. So there's so many different ways to go about it. We were trying to decide do we organize it by the historical event that we're looking at it, or do we organize it by the material that's being used, like print or orality or ephemera, or do we organize it by time period? There's just so many different ways to do it. So we we ended up organizing it by um, three different sections based on the material. So we had a print culture section, an oral culture section, and a manuscript culture section. And then with, within each of those, there was also, also sub uh, sections. So you could have something like a broadside ballad or um, an oral recording so you could divide it down more and more. Um, and then things were also tagged uh, with subjects, so if they're related to a historical event that we were looking at or another movement that was that was really important, that was tagged. And then finally there was smaller tags put on if anything just sort of relevant at all. Um, so that way everything was really cross-connected and sort of um, hopefully I think the site would allow people to kind of find one thing and see how it's linked in all these different ways across the board. Um, which was really interesting to me. Um, and I hope that what the site offered, especially for maybe earlier undergraduate students, is sort of a stepping stone to doing primary research. Um, I know when I was an undergrad student doing anything that was primary research finding stuff, and especially when it goes back to the 18th century and mm -hmm. handwritten sources and you're trying to do primary research, it's so scary and so hard and like, I don't know what I'm looking at, it's just overwhelming. So I think having something that's been a little bit more annotated, a little bit more, um, put together and sort of organized and gives you those tags. So you have an idea of what you're looking at, but you're still responsible for finding it and looking at it. So having stuff on the website like that is a really great stepping stone to starting to do research that way for, for earlier students. Um, and as I said before, I think one of the most insightful things I gained from it was just understanding the, the importance and how much control is, is given to people who construct um, learning sources and teaching sources and databases. So I was really surprised by how much s seemingly subjectivity there was involved in deciding how I tag things and how I sort things and what stuff gets put on the site. So even if I, and even in what I find, so if I was looking that day for um, something related to a certain event, I would find all these objects 
and see them as relating to that event, but if I was looking for something else and thinking about a certain type of media, I would find these objects and think of them as relating to that media and see different things in them, and it would make me determine how I wanted to put it up on the site. Um, and I think that's really important um, to see that flip side of it, and hopefully students, because they were able to go ahead and post their own material on the website, I hope that students got maybe a taste of seeing that as well. Um, as students, often you just, the material's handed to you or you're, you're given the syllabus and you read it and you don't think about how much about, don't think so much about how it's categorized and how it's uh, assembled and organized and give it to you, but given that opportunity to see the flip side of it, I think is really crucial in seeing, and, and seeing what's um, available. And lastly, I think um, it also just opens the doors to having more, more uh, objects available, more items available to look at um, that's not available in print. Um, there's so much online, as I said before, it's so daunting as an undergraduate to try and look up, but when it's organized this way, there's, it's more accessible um, and allows people to look at different things and become interested in different things earlier on and really shape what we do look at because it's just more accessible and available. So that's, yeah, something else I found really important about the project. Um, yeah, that was most of my experience in a nutshell. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for kind of sharing an instructor, um, instructor sort of take on, on a project and, as well as the student take as well. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions for, for Leith and Brian before we hear from our final speaker. Any any questions about this project? When you put things together, did you say you used Google Doc or it's, is it like Google? Yeah. yeah, well we were using, I was thinking about Canvas before the SFU site and so we had like um, a collaboration page where you could basically write in a different font in different colored fonts you could see who was writing what so it was all present all being posted online and then that way the instructor could look at it and students could look at it or pick up where things were left off at any time period and add to it so um, I, yeah so I say like a Google Doc yeah, that way but it wasn't a Google Doc but Right. Yeah, this was through Canvas, and then, okay. and then we had the exhibit function on the Omeka site we built, which was a little bit more um, organized and controlled in, in how it was shaped. That's my question. Actually, it's a similar question. Um, full disclosure, I work in tech and policy and privacy stuff um, as part of my role. And it's a messy, messy, messy place. I'm just curious more how much accessibility you all have to that discussion when it comes to considering these kinds of materials and platforms. Um, uh, previously, at Diana and yours, there was the app the, 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 that's taking people's information um, or whatever it's doing, I don't know. Um, but I'm just curious how accessible that conversation is and how, whether or not you feel uh, as practitioners like that's just a horrible jungle you don't want to go near and you're not going to get any support or whether you feel like you have an avenue to kind of um, gain some clarity on what open systems put you potentially into gray zones around some of the policy and what open systems are pretty clear and safe. And it was just a bit kind of like, and that's, that's a great answer to you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So you're, you're thinking about what students put out on public access, is that what you're... Just more that there's a whole pile of issues that kind of um, encroach upon some of the decisions and there's a real ecosystem of of knowledge about what the policy is. Mm -hmm. And so my question is not so much about that as much as how, how much access do you feel as practitioners that, uh, do you have to, like at SFU, to any resources at SFU that can guide you around that stuff? Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm bent for myself anyway, I'm a real learner in this, and so that's certainly one thing that occurred to me as we're going forward. But I think next time I do that, that will be um, something I will look for more direction and, ha and help presenting to the students, um, especially after the Facebook fiasco and mm -hmm. more questions that I'm sure students would have. I think that for me anyway has flagged a lot of issues about um, potentially what we need to discuss with students. For me, I think it was what was really important in that I didn't just get the money for the RA, but that I also got the support. So every time I had a question, I just fired it off to, to oh, who they passed me on to copyright editors or something, so whatever. The problem solving was done behind my scenes, mm -hmm. and then I could pass on my question, and, and all this, what seemed very daunting to me, really daunting actually, mm -hmm. um, 
kind of got wrinkled out really fast. I, I ha I, I'm happy you brought that up because honestly, I. I hadn't thought about it, if I'm being completely honest with you. And now that you say it, I feel like I can't believe I haven't thought about it. No, and because I, I know when, I think there was an iClicker issues as well, or there was another system that we were using that, you know, we were worried about the, the information being shared, and <laughs> now I don't know what to do. And I think that that's a, a really good question, is how much, like, where do we go in those situations? And, and, and so... It, on the on the flip side, are we supposed to use a resource that is really expensive because it is, you know what I mean? So where what is going to ultimately make the decision that's best for our students? And I don't know the answer to that. So I would I would love the support mm -hmm. on that. On I I I just had like pff, I can't believe I didn't think about that. Yeah. They don't share a lot of information on there, but yeah, information's gold, and I tell them that as well, so, yeah. It's a good point, it's a great co point. Yeah. When I did the eye clicker and Christina yeah. helped me and she said that if you put like through LMS, the eye clicker and that access like their data is going to be somewhere and then mm -hmm. I have to do some different way that uh, in order to get uh, only <coughs> you or something like that. So I was like, oh, I did that and it was crazy hard. I have to spend so much time looking at each and they change their eye clicker numbers. Yeah. Oh, that was crazy. So and, and I think it just gets into how many things there is to think of yeah. when you're putting a course together and we're all trying to do the best for our students and trying to consider their needs in different ways. But there's also as technology evolves as well, there's issues that we couldn't have even have thought about. Wow. Right, and we weren't necessarily tr no. I, I wasn't at least trained to be a teacher. <laughs> I was just thrown into it. So, and luckily, I love it. But you know, it's uh, it's an excellent point. I, I know we have some uh, representatives from the Teaching and Learning Centers, mm -hmm. uh, Learning Technology uh, support team in the room as well. And I think often when we get some of those uh, those questions about privacy risks, so uh, we we do tend to those tend to be our go to experts for for some of those questions as well. So. I'm not sure if anyone wanted to jump in or add to that from, from the team, but... All right, well, I think we, we may end up kind of circling back to that question and some of the issues it raises as well, but I um, wanted to make sure we have time to hear from our final speaker today, uh, Petra, Petra Menz from Mathematics. Yeah, so I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Mathematics, and I'm just going to tell you briefly how I came to to be on this project. So you won't see any slides from me. You get me, you get my presence, which is big right now because I'm over my head deep in the project. Mm -hmm. um, so I have always been interested in uh, the writing aspects of uh, curricular development. Um, I used to be a high school teacher and I was seconded actually by the Ministry of Education for several years to write uh, the math, uh, aspects of the math curriculum. Um, so that was my first big writing experience. And then when I was hired at SFU shortly thereafter, around 2005, um, there was this wave that went through uh, Canada to Canadianize everything. Not be American, but to be Canadian. And so uh, I was approached by a textbook company and um, I became one of these co-authors of a calculus textbook that Canadianized the textbook. <laughs> um, that experience, um, was deeply unsatisfactory and disillusioned me about this whole writing um, ex uh, project or experience, I have to say. Um, especially because I had a couple of ideas that I had wanted to do and I had appro approached the textbook uh, company uh, about them, but every time it was like, how much money can we make out of this? How much money? How much more can we charge the student because we're now doing X and Y and Z? And uh, so I kind of let these things go, and the textbook company luckily let me go too. <laughs> so we kept this textbook for about 10 years, and it served us really well. But, but what has happened in a really fast, mega way over the last uh, eight years, I would say, is that digital technology just mushroomed out of control and became really accessible to us as educators. And it's kind of, it was, it's kind of a tease to all these ideas that, that I had and I think that I've heard from here is how can we use it and implement it in our courses. 
So at the, so this is why I'm so this is where I was coming from. But then I'm also um, a uh, workshop co coordinator in my department, which is basically a mass health center, out of um, that puts together several different math courses, and then we service the students through this mass health center and also the instructor. We sort of the managers of it, and we also have about 15 to 18 TAs that we that we supervise along with that. And so one of these math help centers, in two of the courses, a textbook from UBC was being adopted and then adapted for our needs. And so I was already seeing what is hap happening there and then kind of in a conversation that I had with then educational consultant Cindy Shin that some of you may know, she kind of said, hey, there's this SFU OER grant, why don't you apply and then maybe you can realize your dreams that you want to have for this one particular calculus course. And uh, to my jo joy or horror, <laughs> I got this grant <laughs> because I don't know, I completely forgot what it's like to be <laughs> in the midst of all of this writing and development mm. and, and realizing it um, but in the end I'm really happy that I've done it so I think I got it a year ago actually That's right. and uh, so here I am now and you're saying well is she still up in her over her head because I'm doing this for two follow-up courses so in calculus we have differential and integral calculus that are first year and second year term and now the real fundamental reason why I wanted to develop it is because this is a first year course and for the most part we get students that are transitioning from high school into university and uh, never mind the material that we have to teach. What I've seen over and over and over again is that there's a real need to teach these students to, to guide them better in how they should be learning the material and just to adjust to academia. And so, yes, I've, uh, I've uh, developed yet another calculus textbook you may think but it's not quite like that because in my search and I am very grateful because Hope and I forgot the other person's name that's the, uh, the liaison with mathematics helped me in finding what is out there and there is a little bit out there but um, in the end the three resources that we found is one of them only contained two out of the ten subjects that we have to <laughs> teach so it really Okay, it wasn't really a choice. And the other one only contained half of what we needed, so I still would have had to create things from scratch. And the third one, which we did adopt because it contained the most, but it also was, um, it was more simplified. We, I really wanted to have something very rudimentary. Um, in the end, when you read through it, you could tell, oh yeah, chapter one and two were written by person X, and then came mm. person Y, mm. and then came person Z. So, Throughout this text, there's so many inconsistencies, and this is a lot of my time that I spent because I really wanted to make this a good product. I wanted a student to read, and and it be, it's cohesive, and it's not different here and there. The other thing that I wanted to achieve was, just like Diana said, in the end, my feedback that I've been getting from students over and over again is, hey, I'm learning from your lecture notes anyways. What do I need the textbook for? Uh, my own calculus textbook still cracks. <laughs> because I never opened it. Mm. And so what I've done now is I produced course notes and lecture notes and student notes that are all totally tied into each other. And the course notes are just a little bigger mushroom around the lecture notes. And in my lecture notes, I constantly say things like, study this or read up on that. And it's short. And it just gives a glimpse of what, if you would be a second, third year student, I would expect you to do. And for the lecture notes, I adopted this Cornell note style taking, and I slapped it onto the, the lecture notes, and so the students can mark up all the time, what do I not understand, where do I have to follow up, note taking space. It, it, it seems simple and little, but in the end, it hadn't been done. And so I used this opportunity to, to do it. Um, and I think I should also pause, because it's so great that, I, that we have Aaron here and Brian, is that your name? Yeah. Um, because I I decided to put my research assistant on as an author because she did so much work. Not only was she my technical help, 
and use LaTeX or not Pressbook, but it's our own math language that we use to 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 um, write up uh, mathematics. But she was also the source of the mathematics, like the a sounding board of the math mm. that I had to write, and bounce back to me. Hey, are you really sure you wanted to say that? Or uh, you know, if I'm reading as a student, this doesn't sound quite right. So it was a constant back and forth. And yes, I'm the creator of sort of the. the big vision behind it and all this detailed writing that I had to do here or develop another chapter there. But there were so many visuals that we put into it and I'm sorry that I didn't bring any slides. Um, and she developed them because all I had to do is say, I, I want this and I want it from this point of view, uh, not what you standard get in a, t a textbook. I want it like that. And she did it. Yes, she had, she had wrinkles to overcome, but it was a huge learning opportunity for her. So. Thank you to Nicola Mulberry. She's a graduate student in the math department. And you know what? She had wanted to end her graduate career in academia because she had found it boring. <laughs> and she has now applied to continue and become a PhD graduate student because of this project. Um, and it kind of gave her a little more time into the teaching and learning aspect as well, not just the, the math research that she was doing. Um, I prepared this, sorry. <laughs> I'm just, what is it that I'm missing that I wanted to say? So <clears throat> the other part that I wanted to address here as well, um, I've taught this course for 11 years. And I had a, now a almost two year break from it, yay. Because <laughs> I walked in, I didn't even need my notes anymore, which is a good thing, but in the end, you know, enough is enough, you need a little bit of a break from, from some of these courses. I'm excited again about teaching this course. So there's a, re um, because I can, it will, all my experiences that I've gained and with meetings from colleagues like Diana and, and other people, even from English, with Lee, that, that the exchanges that I get and how I can make this course better and from the student feedback that I can uh, got, I can realize this now with this course. And, but in the end, I also have to face from my department that this is a first year course and we often get sessional instructors teaching this course or we get postdocs or our own mature gr graduate students wanting to teach. And so what courses do we give them? So having a course like this that has fully develop, developed course notes, lecture slides, student slides, the assignments all developed along with it, it's a package that I can give to them and say, here, teach from it. You don't have to develop anything. You can now think about what is it that you want to do in the classroom. Do you want to have a blended learning classroom? Do you want it flipped? What is it that you want to do? Bring in clicker questions. We have a set of those as well. Right? So it gives much more flexibility, transferability, and so on. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, any questions for, for Petra here about her project? All right, I think what we might do, just to try to generate a few questions for the panel here in the time that we have remaining, is let's just take a couple minutes if you want to just turn to the person next to you and just share um, your name, if you haven't met each other yet, um, which department or unit you're from, and just share what's one question you have about using OER in practice now after kind of listening to the panel. We'll just take maybe a couple minutes to do that and then uh, come back with a few questions for the panel. Any, any questions for our panelists? One of the questions that came up here was outside of SFU and all of the TLC grants and things, what about from other schools or smaller schools that don't have those resources in place? Um, we talked a little bit about OpenStax, but are there other places that people can um, look to? Yeah. Or? And I might, because we have Lucas in the room, yeah. um, Lucas, can I put you on the spot to talk a little bit about BC Campus support for? Yeah, I mean, BC project? Campus is uh, a great place to look for those grants. So we offer grants every year usually, um, and they're typically offered in the spring, and again there's OER creation grants and also ancillary grants, um, and it's also worth reaching out and just asking about the project you're doing because we can't provide overall support. Um, there's also the Open Textbook Network, which a number of institutions belong to. 
um, where they get OER support. And OpenStax is also worth approaching separately and seeing what sort of support they can provide, especially in a book that they may have a gap, something they're wanting to create as well. Okay. Thank you. Certainly talking talking to the library on campus as well. Um, and sometimes the library may have a may have a sense about any kind of local supports or you know folks with some some expertise in that area of support projects. Well. Can I just say something to this too? Because I, I've just attended uh, Changing the Culture, which is a um, one day workshop run out of PIMS, the Pacific Institute for Mathematics and Sciences here, um, where educators from post-secondary educators and high school and elementary and mathematics teachers meet. And in spaces like this, I, I think a networking kind of place where you should spread the word about OER. And you'll be surprised there's so many people that want to do collaborations. And if there's already even a little bit of a product like what I had and adopted it, the company, the, uh, the company actually, well, a company sprang out of where I adopted mine from. They've already approached me to, to extend it to something else as well. So I think you need to network and talk about it and collaborate with other people because there's many people that will use this product and the more people collaborate on it, it gets shaped into what they what they want. Any other questions out there for, for the panel here? Can the panel ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering, so I like using videos a lot in my mm -hmm. lectures for sci science, anatomy, human body, really important. But where, how do you know which, like sometimes I'll link to a YouTube video and then it's gone next semester, right? So how do you know what is that I can take and reuse and, and own? Like how do you know, or videos from other sources too? How do you search for those, and like, where are they, and how do you know that they are of that kind? Right, and I, Jason, I'm looking at you here too. Yeah. I feel like you might have some uh, some thoughts, sir. Um, yeah, videos are interesting because YouTube is is pretty much the primary source yeah. of videos on the internet. Yeah. And um, doing a, a discussion at the Festival of Learning next week on this exact topic. Um, YouTube has two licensing options, the standard YouTube license mm -hmm. and then their, their open Creative Commons license. But it doesn't have the, the, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Lucas, but it doesn't have as granular, like, for, like, share a like mm -hmm. and the, like, not for commercial use options, because they have their own economy built in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, but it's an interesting, as far as like um, what you can find, um, you can do, use Google advanced search and, and search specifically the internet mm -hmm. for um, resources. Images you will find more than videos, but mm -hmm. if, the, if the website like YouTube has built in mm -hmm. a Creative Commons setting that authors can choose, Google will find those and filter those in your search. So that's the quick one that I use all the time mm -hmm. um, with our Ed Media program. It's just how to use Google, um, that, that one part of the advanced mm -hmm. search, which is really useful. Mm -hmm. um, but sorry for interrupting, no, but I, st I still find uh, for one of the online courses that I have that every term I have to go through this again, or code says, hey, dead link, still dead link yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Because I use stuff from from the UK or from Australia because they've developed really great resources, but they may have changed something. Mm -hmm. yeah. and then, so it's, the instability, I think, is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's just, that's what digital media is. Yes. yes? <laughs> and you have to be sort of engaged, searching, renewing, and like your point about having the network Extend, like extending your, your searches by collaborations and stuff is um, once you have a relationship with the person who's generated mm -hmm. um, those. So, so we, we've had several SFU faculty that have made videos and just sort of published them on YouTube and, and, and left. Um, but these are found like years old and they're still getting emails about can I use this video? Is this free licensed? Um, I'd like to work, put it in my course. So it always depends a bit on the publisher, like the mm -hmm. author. 
um, who's, who's made them. Some, well, and then on the other side of the spectrum now, with video specifically, you've got the YouTuber generation. Mm -hmm. So this is changing, I, I, I think, some very interesting questions about how academics publish. Um, because YouTubers are, des are they want to make money. They mm -hmm. want hits. They want views and mm -hmm. subscribers. So they curate their videos in, in way different ways. But they, they are meant to be found and to persist. So as... Um, I don't know about as a researcher looking for so much, mm -hmm. but as a creator, you you can intentionally form your media practice around longevity mm -hmm. and and reach. I call reach in the YouTube mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. world is. I mean, I think o OER really is going to be looking a, a lot mm -hmm. at um, at at YouTubers and this sort of new mm -hmm. economy of scale. Mm -hmm. Because um, that's what we want. We're giving away content, mm -hmm. kind of, and we want it to be found and be used by other teachers. So the, what, what our academic ways of publishing is, is quite different from, okay. and it's, it's like a lot of little tricks. It's sort of like tricking the, uh, the search engine and YouTube mm -hmm. itself into keeping your content high on the list and making sure. It's, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because the next thing on my list I didn't mention that is I have to develop these little content videos that I also developed for another course because students really love them short snippets of something that's really difficult for them and they can just listen to it over again and that works but I should go to where teaching and learning center for the to how to make these the longevity yes. of these Bigger? Yes. <laughs> okay. Because I got this Camtasia. I see Kevin in there. Mm. We got Camtasia and we want to produce stuff for ourselves. But it's better to involve them, you guys. To well, I, and I would hope that that's not really a service that we. Oh, I see. It's okay. on the website. But you can give us ideas. Absolutely. I mean, it didn't, I didn't even think about that. And it's very, uh, it's very uh, like in my mind because of this presentation next week, and, and I'll be hosting a discussion. And I'll be able to gather a lot of resources of what um, the, there are academics that are taking this on, trying to trying to put their stuff out there as videos, but not just sort of um, here's a link to my flip like tutorial that you can read and then come discuss. But they're actively trying to seek a revenue stream from it, which is obviously put them in conflict with their institution. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, their institution is benefiting. So there's a bit of a, a paradox there. Plus, sometimes the, the ad that's linked to the video a is a huge conflict yes, to absolutely. the video as well. Yeah. And I think that's one of the differences. You can, in YouTube, you can turn those off as the author. Mm -hmm. And if you choose an open license, you can still put ads on, which is going to give you your revenue streams. Yeah. I didn't think about it. I think it's inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I see that um, lunch is in the room and kind of distracting over there. <laughs> so, uh, we're just about, just about at lunchtime here. So I think our panelists may be sticking around for uh, at least a few minutes uh, if you have any questions individually for them. But um, and just to join me at Keys and, and thanking them for uh, taking the time out of their busy schedules to share some of their experiences. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.